selectman has been um, really uh, in conjunction with the, the building inspectors um, directive and just concerns of the community really been pushing for um, some more information in terms of um, options going forward. Uh, this um, is an early report. It's not going to contain all the possibilities we had earlier asked for uh, and really solicited ideas from the community, thoughts from the community. We had a lot of folks send emails. We want to continue that process. So we just um, want to, uh, wanted to do this. Um, in fact, I really insisted that there be a report coming this month. So we're going to uh, start with where the engineers are and what we have right now just so we can uh, start start the process on this review and the deliberation. Uh, so welcome if you would introduce yourself. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, my, and, and the board and the management here in town. My name is Steve Weah. <clears throat> I'm with Weston and Sampson Engineers. Um, I have done work here in the town, I think, for the last 11 years or so. Um, but I, way of background, if you don't know me, I know many people in town, but I haven't been here since 2014, I think. Um, so I'm a professional geologist by education. I've worked for 29 years in the engineering geosciences. Um, 24 years I've been a licensed professional geologist in Florida and New York. And the last 11 years I've worked for Weston and Sampson engineers. Weston and Sampson is a 120-year-old um, civil engineering firm primarily. We're engaged in water, wastewater, renewable energy, environmental issues. Um, and we were asked um, about in 2007, about the time that I came on with the company, um, to, to help out in looking at a wind turbine project. And, and the town, I compliment, you know, I heard some things during the coastal resiliency that sounded a lot like what the town was talking about 11 years ago. And it's tough to be first, um, but you guys have a great town. You run a very good town here. I've been to many towns throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in my time developing renewable energy projects. Just to give you a little bit of background, um, we've looked at probably 44 sites, all in New England, most in Massachusetts, where we have studied wind, solar, biomass, um, hydropower. Um, 22 of those feasibility studies have been focused solely on wind. We have helped design and permit, like here in Falmouth, 13 projects, six of which went to construction with 11.4 um, megawatts worth of wind turbines. Um, representing eight individual units. And when I started in Massachusetts, there were only five wind turbines that were in operation, to give you an idea. Um, since then, we've probably helped develop 200 plus megawatts of solar projects. 16 kW, a small little rooftop on Crooked Pond Solar at the water treatment plant was part of the ARA Shovel Ruddy projects, as was Wind 2 at the time. Um, we also did some feasibility studies related to um, the development of the four megawatts that's on the closed landfill, and we still do inspections for Citizens Energy for compliance with DEP as relates to that project to give you an idea. So, with that, um, again, our involvement primarily with Wind 1 and Wind 2 have been focused on design and permitting and construction phase engineering services. Um, this particular last study that we had done um, when Julian had called me and asked that we wanted to look at some things, um, this was really a, a small study. It started out as a $14,000 study when we first talked about it in the springtime. Um, and he wanted to examine the feasibility of implementing an action and specifically moving the turbine so as to lessen the impacts of the turbine in the community. Um, the scope that we had talked about was to evaluate an alternate location for wind two. Um, estimate what those likely sound impacts would be based on the preponderance of data that we have collected. Falmouth happens to be a town that has been the focus of a lot of study and so there'll be a lot of good information that we have already collected. Um, to give you an idea, a $14,000 feasibility study is fairly small in the context of doing a wind feasibility study that often start at $40,000 and then often go over $100,000 when you're looking at putting up MET towers, which the town had already done a long time ago, to measure the wind resource, to do background sound studies to measure ambient and what the likely impacts would be, um, shadow flicker impacts, all of these things are, are elements and, and parts of a feasibility study. The, the primary one, of course, is to estimate what the energy production is, because 
you, if you're going to build a wind turbine, it has to produce energy from wind in order to be effective. Um, to develop an opinion of probable cost to move that wind turbine, we looked at some alternate uses of wind one, um, and then we added an economic analysis um, just to round out because most feasibility studies are focused on um, technical feasibility and financial feasibility. And something that's technically feasible may not be financially um, feasible, and, and a, a go, no go decision should be made based on that data. I wonder, if, well, on your back slide, if you could just make a quick comment about the difference in the analysis uh, between wind one and wind two because I noticed it says alternative location for wind two but not wind one and it just says alternative use of wind one. So um, for the alternate use of wind one I think that what we had done is in our discussions we had focused because um, of some of the, uh, the, the permitting pathways that we had started down with wind one the last time I was here in 2014 um, we were directed to file and we were helping support uh, Zoning Board of Appeals and that, that was identified as the proper pathway at the time um, to look at, at permitting and so um, that permit ultimately was denied by the ZBA and so um, it, it, if wind one is not legal where it stands then you have to look at either moving it or taking it down and so some of the alternate uses um, might have been to turn the tower into a communication like a cellular tower. Um, we had also talked about looking at um, resale and if there was a, a, a buyer out there that wanted to put it to use, it could be in Nebraska, you know, for all we know. Um, it could also potentially be used for spare parts because parts for wind turbines are expensive and, and the operation and maintenance costs, they're expensive on a year-over-year -year basis and if something breaks, that's above and beyond. It's sort of like a, an automobile in that regard that the longer they've been in service, the more care that they, they generally take. Um, so just to, to summarize, sure. um, both Win 1 and Win 2 could be relocated out of town, but only Win 2 potentially might be located in town. That, that's in the place. prevailing wisdom at this moment. Is that, okay. Right. Um, and so we looked at, at some of the, in the alternate locations, we looked at what the, the site layout, so basically um, how much real estate you had, um, what the setbacks needed to be, and, and the elevations, all of those play a role in siting a wind turbine ultimately. Um, so to, for the existing site uh, configuration, just to give you an idea, um, and I apologize, one of the things that we worked on, we just finished this report, on, published it on Friday, we had a meeting during the week, and one of the things that uh, Julie and I had talked about was, because of the scale of this, sometimes we engineers or geologists print things that are so small, they're very difficult, unless you zoom in and look at them, but um, to give you an idea, the, the parcel itself, contiguous land that the wastewater treatment plant sits on is about 328 acres. Um, so you see this bold uh, lime green line on the outside, that's the parcel line. Um, and then what you'll see is this dotted line that is technically what we consider the safety setback, and that's the fall zone plus 10% of the structure height. Um, and so automatically, any location for wind one or two, if you were to move them, would have to be inside of those boundaries. And, and then we start looking at things like topography and elevation. Um, give you an idea, wind one sits at an elevation of 151 feet above sea level, wind two is about 130 feet above sea level, um, and the notice turbine, which you can see uh, in the image, which is over here off of your property, sits at about 170 to 178 feet in elevation. So the land generally slopes down to Route 28, and it gets higher as you go towards the, um, the east side of this parcel. Um, so. If we look at some of the interior spaces, the other considerations that we look at when we're uh, trying to site a turbine are just environmental considerations. Are you in a wetlands that, you know, um, you would have to do either some additional permitting, there's some natural heritage and endangered species programs. As us look at species, there are, as a, uh, I think the box turtle has been identified as a species of concern out here that you would have to deal with. Um, and also, just geomorphically, this is a, uh, a glacial uh, deposits that has a lot of kettle holes that go down as low as an elevation of 15 feet on the same property. So there's a, uh, a big discrepancy. And if you took a wind turbine like this and you put it in a kettle hole, it frankly isn't going to work very effectively as a wind turbine. Um, 
the alternate location when we looked at them. Um, again, and, and I'll flip probably back and forth to this so that you can see really those circles that are, have been drawn here. Um, they're also with respect to sensitive receptors. And, and, and so we look at where the base of the turbine is and the GIS analysts snap a distance and they, they pull a circle out until they touch the first residential property. And a residential property is considered a sensitive receptor from a sound impact or flicker impact. Um, unlike the commercial um, properties where people aren't exposed 24-7 if they live on their property, people that go to work in an, in an, in an industrial park um, may have eight hours of exposure. So these stem from DEP noise policy guidelines that we take our cues. And so we looked at what these distances were. Um, and from wind one, the nearest residential abutter on the south side to Blacksmith Shop Road um, is just over 1,300 feet, um, 1,303 feet to the nearest residential abutter. And wind two was 1,102 feet, I think, if I read that correctly. Um, and so these are the circles that we draw just to see um, how close they are. The rule of thumb used to be a thousand feet, but we know that through a lot of the study here, the sounds um, and, and, and sights of a wind turbine um, can be smaller than a thousand feet. So we, we looked at an alternate location, again, within the property that moves this within the safety setback and tries to put it as far away from any other residential receptors that we could possibly get. And I think from, from this location that has an elevation of 115 feet um, is 2,147 feet to the nearest residential uh, receptor to the north and 2,244 feet uh, to the nearest residential receptor to the south. And that takes the wind two from its present location and would have to build a road to go down along these settlement basins and, and to build it to be able to access it. It's about a half a mile moving it from its present location to this alternate location. And we call that alternate location one because there's an infinite number of places that you can move it. We had to decide on something that made sense from a wind sighting standpoint first. Um, so that's the location. And a lot of the analysis was done from this to calculate we civil engineers if we want to figure out how much something costs, we have to know where it's going to go, how long the road has to be, the electrical duct bank, all of the interconnection issues all revolve around picking a location. Um, and so this is sort of just a conceptual site plan of where it would go. There's an amount of clearing that has to be done in order to erect this. The ground is generally, this access road is a little bit wider um, than your typical you know, uh, F-150 pickup access because of the size of the equipment that has to be brought in to move it. It's not a, no small feat of an engineering to set it up. And you have to have about three or four acres of a clear area in order to just assemble the rotor on the ground to be able to pick it up with a crane and put it into place. Um, so moving to the sound impacts, um, we took a lot of the data um, that had been accumulated by HMMH and others that were hired um, a number of years ago to study this. And we looked at the data that had been collected from both long and short term monitoring points. And we didn't attempt to recreate any of these acoustical studies because frankly they, they cost a lot of money. I think that we probably spent in excess of $150,000. Um, in years gone by in setting up <coughs> microphones and collecting, measuring, and analyzing a lot of data. Um, so we tried to synthesize this and, and, and boil it down to its essence in terms of what the sound impacts are with distance and plotted the available data that we had to see how the sound impacts are likely to be um, at a prescribed distance. And if you knew how far your receptor was away from the proposed location. If it was 2,000 feet, you could simply come off of this graph and expect to hear two decibel above background increase. Um, and again, it's a very simplified way of looking at it, but we thought it was appropriate for this. Yeah, can you explain the, on the, those numbers you're talking about? Sure. When you go from a two to a four, this is on a logarithmic scale, and so it's what effect actually is the relationship between an increase of two decibels and four decibels above. Right, so I'm not gonna attempt or I'm not, I don't hold myself out to be an acoustic professional. Um, <coughs> there has been a lot of debate and, and a lot of information about that in prior reports um, that have been here. Um, 
suffice it to say, the DEP noise policy looks at any stationary news source of sound um, as 10 decibels above background as being considered the potential for a nuisance. And, and if it's more than 10, you're technically in violation. And, and so if it's less than that, but you're right, it is a logarithmic scale. Um, and generally, as it's been described to me, our uh, increases above <coughs> background in the one to three range are barely audible. Um, so it would be it would be difficult to perceive them, but it's not to say that you couldn't hear them. Um, the conditions just have to be right for it. Um, generally, Falmouth is a quiet place, and it's, we've done background studies in Falmouth, in Western Mass, and in Worcester, and in Boston. And the sound backgrounds naturally um, they get louder where you have a more urbanized area. And, the world, unfortunately or fortunately, is getting to be a louder and louder place. Um, but I believe that, if I'm not mistaken from my memory, 28 decibels was the average um, sound background noise levels in Falmouth. So it's fairly quiet. And, and natural background sound levels are masked by the wind blowing through trees. And <clears throat> you've heard all of these things with birds and crickets and things all add to the cacophony of sounds that are in the background. Um, but one to, to three decibels, I think, is considered pretty pretty low by most people's standards. Not everybody's. Um, shadow flicker. This is just a snapshot out of one of the, the many shadow flicker studies that we had done in support of the ZBA application in 2014. And this is really just to show that there is a, there's a classic bow tie shape that people like to describe in terms of these isoplasts represent uh, hours of shadow flicker that are potential um, based on the sun rising in the east and setting in the west and, and the blades um, that spin and, and will cause a shadow flicker in hours per year. And this model was done, um, it probably set 2,000 feet away from the base of the turbine as the limits of the model. That's why you see it truncated so neatly here. Um, if you extended it out a little bit, they would eventually go to zero. The green areas are where no shadow flicker um, or five to nine hours occur. Um, the red area is 10 to 24 hours per year. And, and the areas that are in blue is where no shadow flicker will be experienced because the phenomenon just can't occur there, the, the, the way that the sun is positioned at this point on the Earth. Um, it is based on the terrain. This model is based on the V-82 with an 80 meter tall tower. If you move this lower, um, you're likely to see those bow ties shrink in size, and if you move it a thousand feet to the right, then the whole thing is going to move a thousand feet to the right. And so we think that it isn't really necessary to model the shadow flicker at any one particular location. We have a fairly good grip on the fact that shadow flicker generally in any of the residential areas wouldn't be experienced if you moved it 2,400 feet over to the east. But would it be experienced in the commercial um Location. In the industrial part? Yeah, it probably would. And that would be yellow? Um, it probably would be yellow based on the distance of the setbacks. Um, uh, that's, that's correct. And it would be only in the afternoon hours when the sun is setting. So, again, feasibility level, energy production. Um, this is fairly standard. We want to know the unit that's going to be produced, how tall is it, what the average wind speed is, the tower height, and to come up with um, how much energy it would end up producing. And so some of the modeling um, variables that we put in are, fortunately we had them all because it's the same units and it didn't take a lot of effort to figure this out. Normally a feasibility study might evaluate a range of turbine sizes. In this case, we only looked at the asset that the town already owns sitting out there. Um, the summary of probable costs to move it at an alter lo alternate location on the wastewater treatment um, property um, is about $3,025,000. And so this is based on what is typically done from the geotechnical design and permitting. There's civil site improvements. That's basically the roadway and the duck bank. Um, the structural site improvements are the foundation system that support wind one and wind two. We have the great fortune of, as engineers, um, these were done under design build. They were both done using the identical foundation design. It's a very um, tried and true design, and it's worked twice, so we're pretty confident it would work again. 
It's just steel and concrete costs a little bit more today than it did 10, 10 years ago. Um, the cost to rig and dismantle, uh, move and re-erect the turbine um, from the vendors that have a crane that are in the 300 ton, 300 feet tall capacity, um, they give an idea of about a million dollars. And, and so this, we compared to the cost estimates and the pay recs that we had, the benefit of having two prior projects that were identical in size and scope. Um, they were very close in terms of what they cost. And, um, and so we could look at that data and, and compare what was done before to what we want to do now. And they're basically the same, with the exception of the project now would involve erecting it. The, the crane, just to dismantle the turbine, the crane has to be taken apart and moved to the new location, the components moved over and then reassembled. So it, it, the common sense would tell you that it would cost a little bit more than the $4.3 million that it cost last time, minus the capital value of the asset itself, which is about $2.8 million. This is what we had talked about just a little bit ago about when one, it could be dismantled and used for parts. Um, Primarily because you have the exact same unit, it's a, it's a, the V82 has long been called a workhorse of it. it, it's actually retired from Vestas' fleet. They have always moved to bigger and better, and so I think the V90 is the smallest turbine that they make now, but they have literally thousands of these that are in use um, in North America and in New England, mostly up in upstate New York, they have um, fairly large wind farms. Um, we looked at scrap value, and, and again, both scrap value and selling it to a third party ended up being a, a wash for the town. And, and what I mean by that is that the cost for a salvager to come in and, and break it, it's a lot like ship breaking, you know, uh, these old tankers, where if they got cut up into pieces that were small enough to haul away for scrap, um, the cost of doing that, they basically would, would do it for you for the value of that scrap and they wouldn't pay you anything and, and, and they, would, they would hopefully make money on that. Um, same thing that when we had originally talked to some folks that were interested in them that again might put them to use in Nebraska, the cost of transporting it from Falmouth to Nebraska comes with a pretty heavy price tag and, and you could probably get some, and you might get a little bit of money, but it wouldn't be a, a, a large windfall. Um, use as a cellular tower, it's certainly possible. Like the, the tower is 80 meter tall. Um, and so from my perspective, and I'm someone that had worked in the heyday of the cellular build out across this country, and it's largely been built out. There are some spotty coverage areas where if you complain enough to your cellular carrier, they might look at putting some more antennas or heaters up, and it might have some value to that, but you'd have to find um, that person or that company that wanted to do that and be willing to pay you to put antennas on the outside of this tubular tower. It's been tried for years in West Falmouth. We'll point people have asked. Yeah, that's a tough road. Yeah. Um, some data points that I know that we were doing studies for the Mass DOT, they actually wanted to put up a wind turbine at the Blandford Rest Area, which a project that never happened. Um, they had, uh, they were a host to some cell towers out there. And, and the value at the time is around $60,000 per year, it's like a typical host fee. If you're a landowner where there was a need for someone to install it, they would put one up. And you see them all over the Cape, there are usually towers with three, four, or five different carriers that have antenna arrays at different heights, and they all lease space from each other, you know, and that's the typical arrangement. Um, that cellular network has largely been built out. You know, you see it in TV commercials all the time. Gosh, wouldn't you have the cost of taking the blades down? You would, yeah. So, there, you know, again, you have to have, uh, you know, the same size. I don't, I don't have the image, but the, the picture that, of the crane that was necessary to hoist the blades into place would still be the same one that you would need to, to, to take them off again. But we have to do that. Well, no, I'm just looking. In other words, um, you could scrap for scrap value. You could get a scrapper to come in and be a, a net zero is what he's saying. But I'm saying with respect to a use of a cell tower, you might get the rent over a number of years, and, but you would have to take away the cost of taking the blades. And you want to have a plan in place for the rental so you don't have a crane coming two times. Exactly. But it's not just the money, it's an improved service for yes. people in town. Right, right. The view is spectacular. You know, there was, 
there was one wind developer I remember talking to 10 years ago, and he wanted to, um, you know, give rides up to the top of the tower for 10 bucks and sell hot dogs to put an observation deck on the top. There's, there's a lot of different things. You talk to different people. Um, so, again, I don't want to bore you too much with the details, but we did um, do a, an economic analysis, and if, if nothing else, it was to update and validate others that have already come before me and done pretty much the same thing. Um, that if you looked at a 20-year project term, um, how many megawatt hours, 300 or 3,500 megawatt hours is 3.5 million kilowatt hours. Um, being nervous conservative engineers, that's a 24% capacity factor. Um, we know from the web turbine and the time that the Falmouth turbines ran, you probably could do better than that in the low 30%. It's a pretty good wind resource. Um, if you did a general obligation bond at 4%, you looked at energy inflation at 3.5%. General inflation to, to add the cost of O&M and your incremental uh, cost um, to, to look at it over a 20-year term. The plant currently uses, we evaluated um, the current energy bill. They use about 1.1 million uh, kilowatt hours per year um, at a retail cost of 15.97 cents is the current rate. We broke down um, all of those charges to see what would be eligible for a credit. Um, the value of the excess is about 12.86 cents. Um, we looked at future rec values in, in the near term and in the longer term. The coincidence factor, that would be 100% because of net metering. It used to be that you could only um, get credit for the electricity that you were using at the time that you used it before they increased the net metering caps from 60 kW up to 2 megawatts with the Green Communities Act that was passed in 2008. Um, O&M, $42.50 per kW. That's a, a current rate to, to provide operation and maintenance service on these turbines. And over a 20-year term, you should reasonably expect 70 million kilowatt hours out of those machines. And the cost of the energy at 10 cents is less than you're um, paying for electricity or your net metering credit, so it has a positive net present value um, of $5.7 million. It has a net cash flow year over year over 20 years of $8.9 million, and these present value benefits and costs um, to come up with a benefit to cost ratio of 2.21, which from an economic perspective isn't bad. Um, that's using an analysis that does the time value of money based on a 20-year loan or a mortgage that you would take out to move that turbine. If you were an investor and you had $3.025 million to put on the table and, and how much will I get on a return on my investment, it's in the mid to low 20s, like about 22 or 23 um, percent return on your investment if you were paying cash for that project, um, assuming that the turbine was allowed to run unrestricted in its location. Um, there was some sensitivity analysis that Sustainable Energy Advantage had done in 2014, I think, that looked at how much curtailment um, would impact the financial returns on it, and I think that they came up with about 32% that any more than 32% of the time in terms of hours per day on average, um, your project economics would erode to the point where someone would urge you not to do the project for financial reasons. So bottom line with respect to the finances, um, in terms of what the benefit the turbine could provide, less the cost of moving would be? So, based on the economics of taking a general obligation bond, $5.7 million is what the, what the benefit would be. So that would be the, the plus, after how many years? Um, that's after 20 years. Is 20 years a reasonable number to use when we turn 20 years is what they originally were available for, right. and we've already had them for eight years, right? right. Yeah, so I mean, you're still reasonable, or should we talk in 12 years? I, so I, I think that it's reasonable. It's it's like taking out a 30-year mortgage versus a 20-year. You know, if your objective is to pay off your principal and your interest faster, you would take out a shorter mortgage. And your and your cost, you have to look at those um, 
those year-over-year -year costs or month-over-month -month costs, and we analyze everything on a calendar year. I'm talking about the lifetime of the, of the yeah. not the loan, the lifetime of the turbine. The asset. So the turbines have a minimum 20-year design life, but they'll often last a little longer than that. You know, and 25 to 30 is an unreasonable. If it if it's been in, um, if it hasn't been used heavily, meaning that it's been curtailed or all we're doing is maintaining it where it's standing, it probably has more life than, than not. Well, we were being told when we went through the whole process that the using it less actually shortened the lifetime of it. So, and it, so I guess I'm a little concerned now we're hearing, no, actually curtailing it lengthens the lifetime of it. Right. So it, again, it's like, it's like any other mechanical machine. And that if a turbine was sitting and, and it was on the ground to where they were manually rotating the bearings to keep from flat spots developing in those, um, then it probably would have a shorter life for that reason. Because it's up and it's being mechanically moved, you know, it's um, in a state of what they call freewheeling. I think where if you stop and look at it, it's not spinning from the wind blowing, but it might be moving slowly in a counterclockwise. That's just so that you're, 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 you're doing the minimum amount to lubricate everything and keep the systems, you know, go. It's like a boat. If the, the boat that doesn't get run tends to erode pretty quickly, you know, but if you run it and go out and keep it moving, keep the fuel fresh in it, the oils, the lubrications, then it will last a lot longer. Questions? Madam Chair, I should just interject that uh, as part of um, uh, exercise in the stewardship over these large and complex machines, we have had the manufacturers and the Selecting Jones is referred to. We did have some concerns about the curtailing and the, the impact that that might have on a machine that was arguably designed to run 24 7, like the web or the notice turbine has been doing for the last four to five years uh, without significant problems. Um, but that, that had been our uh, maintenance message to Vestas, the manufacturer, who um, we've been working with in terms of taking those issues into account and maintaining them. Um, as a productive asset, so I just wanted to underscore that we have been doing that uh, as well. Yeah. Can I go back to the flicker question? Sure. And that bow tie shape that you had. Is it reasonable to assume, just on a rough basis, that you could take that same bow tie shape on the bottom curve and move it to ALL1, and you're going to get pretty close to the same distances? And in my estimate of drawing it in, you may hit two of the businesses but nothing of uh, residential gets hit by it. And right. even the residents, even the businesses, it's in the, maybe the green area, or the, uh, not the yellow, but either the green or the red area that does get affected by it. But you can really put that bow tie right on and say, yeah, we're fairly certain as to what the yeah. flicker effect's gonna be. Yes, the, and again, it, it is uh, based on topography. Like if you put that higher, right. the shadows will get longer. So if you're going at a lower elevation, I'm pretty confident, having done a lot of the modeling before, that, that it would be this or less. Right. And, it, and it likely wouldn't, wouldn't extend past Route 28. Because in my, in my not trying to just move it up there, it's not even anywhere close to Route 28. Right. But maybe I'm just that the distance. No, no, you're not. You're, you're correct. Other questions from other people? When you say in your report that it would meet zoning guidelines, that's the common zoning guidelines for the current? Um, so, right, so the, the section on permitting, we, we touched on this um, local permitting. So, section 240.166D um, provides that wind energy systems lawfully in existence as of the effective date of this article, which was adopted in 2013, shall be considered conforming um, and may apply for a special permit um, under this article to relocate. And so that's our opinion and that's our interpretation of the bylaw, um, is that it, it, a special permit application, and again, it's a discretionary permit. We could go to the planning board like we did the ZBA, and if in their discretion they said that they wouldn't issue a permit, then you couldn't build it theoretically in this alternate location. So then, just 
want to take a look at sort of the numbers in, in general. So if you had that five million plus number that we just looked at for win two. That's, and, at, that's after you paid for it. Right. But that, so for win one, you have a, the dismantling at around three million. Is that correct? That's the dismantling and reconstruction to get it back up and looking serviceable again in, in its new location. Okay. Um, oh, I see. Okay. And, and I, I would direct you to page 6.7 of the report, table 14, and I apologize for all of these tables, but it's hard to get all of these numbers presented in a, in a way that makes sense. And, and these year over year, so table 12 are the project benefits year over year, table 13 are the project costs. And then 14 nets those two, so you can see what the total revenue minus the annual cost gives you the net cash flow. And it kind of starts at around $627,000 in revenue from um, net metering credits, credits to your own bill for the energy that wouldn't be purchased to run the wastewater plant, um, and then the sale of RECs. And then the costs are mostly the principal and interest payments, O&M and administrative costs of, of insuring um, the turbine would be about $332,000 per year to net just under $300,000 for the first year. And then those go up again, escalated and in indexed to a 3.5% rise in electricity. And me being a nervous conservative engineer, I'm always skeptical. I ratcheted that down and I did the modeling just to prove to myself that if energy didn't escalate at 3.5%, but only a half a percent, the project is still. Um, very positive in terms of that benefit to cost ratio that we try to zero in on. And anything with a benefit to cost ratio of 1.0 something, 1.0 is break even, meaning that you would get nothing for it for all of your troubles. If it was less than one, then financially I'd call it a donkey, you know, that it, you wouldn't want to ride that donkey. Um, but at 2.21, it's substantially positive. And, um, the sensitivity analysis in Table 11 says that even if we if we said that energy is only going to rise in value that it produces, because that's the commodity that, that you're making is electricity. Um, if it only rose at a half a percent, it would still be 1.78 cost to benefit ratio, which is substantially positive from our view, from the projects that we've looked at. And of those 22 studies that I've done across the state, um, there have been plenty that have been like 1.04. It just didn't have the, the merits, you know, to move forward with it if money was important, you know, which in a lot of towns that are cash-strapped, money is important, right? Well, I guess, oh, sorry. Okay. So what my question was, um, and I see from the back that there, you know, that this project, we, you didn't include um, anything about win one, sort of the long term, if it's, you know, what we do with it. So I just wanted to make the point that I know we don't have, since we didn't include that, we don't have the exact numbers, but that $5 million dollar, number while that is very positive that's that doesn't include the cost that the town incurs regarding win one that's right so at the end of the day if it's you know maybe not three million because we wouldn't be taking it down and re-erecting it necessarily but if it's some if it's either a wash which sounds like the best case scenario or some amount of money to dismantle it that five that profit from that five million is diminished somewhat so i just that's want right. to make sure the five million strictly um is dealing with wind too and doesn't. It look is. Okay. Right. Very, very specific. Okay. Thank you. Right. The second point to make is if we relocate wind two, the likelihood that our $5 million grant stays as a grant is very high, as opposed to it turning into a loan that we have to repay. And so there's also that additional $5 million that does enter into the calculation as to what to be doing with it. Right. The, um, this first presentation, I mean, there's a lot of material that's only released to the public today. Um, when you, you know, the Board of Selectmen has um, really huge concerns in terms of all of the projects um, that Falmouth has on its plate going forward. Fire stations, we, we just had Bob talk about recreation, we're looking at fields, we're looking at water. Um, there's just a you know, just a, a infrastructure um, maintenance for town buildings, town roads, climate um, change issues with potentially moving all of those infrastructures. So, you know, this is a very propitious question that's going to take some time to, you know, review. There are other alternatives. Um, this is kind of a, you know, a, a little bit of a broad stroke of the issue, but we wanted to 
have an opportunity for the public to review it. We want to certainly um, have an opportunity for um, the, you know, particularly planning um, to take a look and, and other interested boards at energy folks. Um, and, and just uh, time for the Board of Selectmen to digest at least this, you know, this first stroke of information and, um, and possibilities. I do want to open um, this time out to some uh, questions from, uh, from the audience. We are also going to um, certainly ask for um, any kind of written email questions from members of the public. Uh, we won't necessarily have answers for you today, but everything will be considered. I wonder if, um, is Mark cool out there? Um, Mark, you had said some correspondence. Would you mind just starting just kind of a quick overview of the question you raised, or do you want to leave it with your correspondence? Thank you. I'm Mark Cool, Precinct 6, and uh, thank you for a good presentation. Oh, may I interrupt just for a second? Yes. Just, I know I said it at the beginning, but I want to two remind minutes. everyone we'll go for 10 minutes, no more than two minutes. Okay. Thank you, Mark. I'll make it brief. But first, I want to say go Clippers and go Sox. <laughs> so, um, bottom line after listening to this and realizing Steve. Through you, Madam Chairman, question to Steve. Um, permitting. I think the elephant in the room is the uncertainty about, Steve had mentioned uh, 240.166D, the exception provision. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of pushback, and um, that is ground in the fact that there's an uncertainty as to zoning classification whether the structure is considered a non-complying structure, a non-conforming structure, and obviously it's not a conforming structure, but so it's one of those two. <coughs> My complaint and the eventual removal of one, win one, or the decree for the removal uh, from the building commissioner said that uh, win one was without a special permits, thus it was non-complying. Um, uh, the building commissioner was silent in the response to Mr. Funfar with regard to Wing 2. But I gave you my correspondence just to draw your concern that that, that is the biggest elephant in the room before the town expends time, effort, and money to researching and examining and exploring um, relocation ideas. So that, that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. We, you know, as I said, we won't necessarily have yep. answers specifically, but I thought, um, having read, as, as I'm sure uh, some of the other board members did, all the board members as well, that's something that I just wanted everyone to hear, you know, with respect to that being an important issue. Um, please? Okay. Um, hold up. Um, one at a time. Well, Dave, if you could just wait a, a second. I, I know you had your hand up. You'll be right after him. I, he was quick on the drawer. You'll be right after him. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Uh, Ron Swag, Precinct 1, uh, town meeting member. Uh, I, am, um, I, I noticed in uh, Friday's paper, I come across, uh, there was a, uh, a headline saying, um, lawsuit keeps development on hold. And uh, I know you're aware that there's a lawsuit or a, an argument before the state of Massachusetts Appeals Court to essentially question and may possibly overturn the, the partial superior court uh, decision by, by one judge to, uh, to, uh, to not op for the town not to operate the turbines. Uh, that, that decision came after a jury trial that was in June of 2017. It was a jury trial uh, concerning whether the turbines created a nuisance, and that where a jury verdict came back uh, saying that they weren't a nuisance. Not one juror was convinced that the turbines, either of them, uh, or especially when one, caused any, any nuisance at all. So the appeals court was also quite interested in the uh, 2007 legislation uh, concerning the. Uh,